kind of going back to what you said, does it matter what Ethiopians want? I mean, in this, in this case, um, uh, Dr. Abi has a lot of support on the ground. Um, uh, it's easy, uh, we can easily say he has a majority of uh, Ethiopian wishes. Like you said, um, the fact that he does um, unite Ethiopians uh, based on their nationality uh, without stripping them off of their culture and their mm -hmm. ethnicity uh, really has highlighted um, uh, his, um, uh, his prominence in Ethiopia. Um, and, you know, elections might, you know, come soon. And, you know, if Ethiopians vote for him and if, if Ethiopians want a, a leader like that, um, how much of, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of sad to be asking this question, but it's just like me asking, could any, you know, um, the U.S. just had an election and they voted for Joe Biden. And, you know, for an outside force to, detect, to, to dictate that or to change that or to want to, um, prior to elections, want to dictate who gets elected. I mean, we've had some of that in the previous election with um, um, complaints of other outside countries' interference. But that's like the first I've heard since... I've, you know, I've been a child and how much of that is, you know, the influence of the Ethiopian people? What, what can Ethiopians do uh, knowing the fact that there are powers, be it um, that would want a fragmented or a weakened Ethiopia um, or even other organizations who would like to take uh, the chance to um, use this um, uh, difficult, challenging times um, as a way to kind of move forward their own um, choice of a leader when in fact that, because that does not really represent Ethiopia currently, like you said, I think it was one of the smart moves um, uh, by the prime minister to create the, prosper the prosperity party because it, it's really um, is the sign of everyone feels represented in it, whether we want to say or uh, admit it or not. Uh, we every Ethiopian in Ethiopia feels represented by that party, whereas the other parties are predominantly belonging to one uh, ethnic group, and there's no um, guarantee uh, to the to the safeguarding of um, other ethnic groups. So, does it matter, you know, for the people in Ethiopia on the ground um, uh, that support the prime minister, and that is their wish? Does it matter? Well. Of course, the, the very question of sovereignty, which was, was first put forward uh, by Nicholas Sapuza in 1430, 1440 in the Council of Florence, and then was reiterated in the Treaty of Westphalia in, in 1648, which was to put an end to the 100 years of fighting between Catholics and Protestants. To, to recognize sovereignty recognizes that there is a unitary power of the nation for the nation to govern itself by its own people for its own future. Those are the key questions. It's actually a much stronger conception than simple democracy. As we know, the United States is actually a democratic republic. Not a, it's not a democracy where everybody just says what they want and that becomes the policy. You want to have intelligent people, thoughtful people, making policy and discussing it with the population. Uh, the question of ethnicity is a real, um, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to use too strong a word, but it really eats away at a people. Because once you think that you're entitled to something else because of your background, and you have leaders who promote that, why do people, you look at elections in Kenya, you look at elections in Nigeria, very much people are voting for the candidate of their ethnicity. Why are they doing that? Because they think if their candidate of their ethnicity gets in, they will get more of the goodies of the country, more of the revenue, more of the services, more of the jobs, more income. So you have to eliminate that. You say, no, you're not gonna get more or less based on your ethnicity. You're gonna, we're gonna to work together to produce more 
for everybody. So it's gonna be a long-term process for the population to come together and actually treat other ethnic groups as brothers and sisters without prejudice. But before we get to that point, the Ethiopian people have a right, however messy the problem is, to determine their own policy. Don't forget interventions against Africa have been going on since the beginning. I mean, this is the problem, that sovereignty is not respected in Africa. Group will come in and say, this is what you should do. We are telling you this is what you should do. We don't like this policy you have. We think uh, President Mugabe is a rotten person. Now, why are you Zimbabwe and still supporting him? Things like that. I mean, of course, you have the case of Patrice Lumumba, who was removed from office within four months because he challenged the European oligarch. So this is a long history of infringement on sovereignty. And my view is, no matter how bad the policies are, we must operate and respect, we must operate through and respect sovereignty. We can't dismiss it. I mean, when the Sudan was under attack for allegations which were false on genocide, American people, I know, by, I know them by name, I confronted them, they're still in the government, and they just felt they could walk all over Sudan. They didn't have to get visas. They would come into South Sudan, cross the border illegally from Chad. These people think that they have a right to say what is good for the Ethiopian people. Now, I don't know the level of support of anybody in Ethiopia, other than when I read the media, when I talk to people, when I go there. So I'm not an expert. I'm not polling the, the Ethiopian people. I'm not taking a poll. But I do recognize questions of sovereignty. And I recognize those individuals who are trying to fight the development of the nation. And when I see someone like that, and I'm not saying this is the case of the prime minister, but I, in other countries, I, I have people I support that because of their policy, even though I might not agree with everything. But once you have a, a leader who's saying, no, we're gonna end this failed policy of ethno-nationalism, and we're gonna have one party representing the people, then I know, this is a serious person. And I, the minute this happens, I know that this person is in danger because I know there are political financial forces who want to keep a fragmented, divided country. So when once the prime minister put himself forward after the honeymoon at the Nobel Peace Prize, he released political journalists from prison, went to Eritrea, all very good things. And once that was over and he began to take responsibility for the nation and steer it in another direction, and then I knew he was going to be attacked. And I told some of my friends that the honeymoon is not going to last. And this is unfortunately the case throughout Africa, not just Africa, we've seen color revolutions, overthrow regimes elsewhere in the world, but it's not legitimate. So the Ethiopian people have to assert themselves as the Ethiopian people. And the best way they could do that I'm not telling anyone who to vote for, but they must, the best way to do that is by asserting for themselves and discussing among themselves the idea of an Ethiopian identity. Are we really different people as the constitution said, the people's plural? No, we are one people. We are one people, one unified people who fought and defeated the colonial imperialists for the sake of our country. And we are not going to give that up in this period. Now, without an economic policy, an inclusive economic policy, that won't happen. But it, it, it's, it will happen. It can happen if the leadership fights for it and inspires the Ethiopian people to recognize who they are and what we did and what we accomplished and what we continue to accomplish. And, and, the, grand, the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, like the railroad, are examples of a quality of thinking and leadership that the Ethiopian people have. And if they can understand that quality in themselves and express it and mobilize around it, then we can defeat those who are, are trampling on Ethiopia's sovereignty. Great, Mr. Freeman. 
any countries that you're familiar with that has passed through these challenges and um, have succeeded? Because we obviously need to uh, learn from them, especially if they're African countries. I mean, I have my guesses, but um, you look at you look similar at, like this. Excuse me. Uh, a country similar to well, like, I was. Uh, my view is that Ethiopia is unique, or somewhat unique, for the reasons I've discussed. They have a, they, the, the Battle of Adwa was has created a mindset for Ethiopian people, which cannot be uh, simply extinguished. And I think uh, through Mel Zenaway's policies that he put forth the concept of the developmental state, uh, as opposed to the free trade concept, he said, no, we have a right to develop our own country and the state has a right to intervene to promote the economic development. Now, this is a very American conception. Most people don't know it. Uh, I just delivered another paper on the founding United States under Alexander Hamilton, our first treasury secretary. And his whole, he raised a, a very robust fight against Adam Smith and the free traders who said, no, we can come in, we'll, we can undercut you, we can sell products cheaper than you. And Hamilton says, no, you're not going to, we're gonna build up a manufacturing industry in the United States. So you can't dump products on it. And Hamilton's policies built the United States into a great industrial power. It's declined a little bit over the last 20 years. But this, this concept of, of having a policy that the state intervened was very much in Mellis Anaway's thought and transferred itself into various parts of the leadership of the country. And I think that is responsible for some of the bold initiatives that the Ethiopians take. You look at Cameroon, what's being done in Cameroon between French speaking Anglophone and Francophone, a product of colonialism. You look what was done in the uh, previous elections in Kenya, a product of British colonialism setting the Kikuyu against the Kalajim against the others. You look at in Nigeria, I happen to know and respect the president of Nigeria, Bahari, I've known him for a long time, and I respect him, but yet Nigerian politics is very divided along Hausa versus Iru versus Yoruba, and then another 200 ethnic groups. You look at the situation uh, you know, in Cote d'Ivoire, where they tried to force a conflict between the North and the South, and they had a very difficult time in the first couple decades of this uh, of this century. So when I, I see this all over being used, being done to manipulate countries, and you see that there is leadership uh, that can fight. They sometimes are not as strong as they could be. And sometimes they don't have enough support around them. So they don't feel confident enough. Some of them are undermined by nasty people inside their own administration. So it's a, it's a difficult fight. And you see that, you know, across Africa, there is a genocide going on, but not the genocide that the reporters want to talk about, not CNN. There's genocide that the African people are dying. We, there's no continent in the world where 4 million children before the age of five die each year of curable diseases, not exotic diseases, of respiratory diseases. Cholera, African continent is the only continent in the world where cholera is endemic. They've never gotten rid of it. Why? It's dirty water. Why? Because we don't have clean water, because we don't have pipes and irrigation that separates the water from dirty from clean. So we see people dying. We see several hundred million people living on $1.90 a day less. We see people waking up each day and they don't know if they're gonna find the food, mothers are gonna find the food to feed their children. And where is the complaints about this? Where is the fight to build a thousand nuclear energy plants to provide energy for Africa? Where is the fight to build irrigation equipment, to build railroads? The only people who started being railroads in the last hundred years are the Chinese. Why doesn't the West build a railroad? It won't do it. So don't talk about genocide in Tigray. Why don't we talk about genocide in the African continent where the same so-called liberal concerned organizations don't do a thing? I one of the projects I'm, I'm somewhat semi-famous for, maybe not famous, recognized, is I have a project to bring water 
from the Congo River to reverse the shrinking Lake Chad. And in the process, build a canal that will set up a massive economic renaissance between the countries of the greater uh, the Central African Republic area, uh, Congo, DRC, Burundi, Rwanda, et cetera, with the Lake Chad Basin, which is an arid basin, as opposed to the Great Lake Basin, which is a moist basin, Cameroon, Niger, Chad, Nigeria. We could do this project. It's a feasible, it's a project that could work, but we haven't got a commitment of a few million dollars to do a feasibility study. And the West refuses, except for Italy, except for the country of Italy, every single other country in the West refuses to build this project while people are dying. 30 million Africans barely survive in the Lake Chad Basin. Now, who's responsible for that? Why aren't the groups complaining about that? And I presented these papers in a conference in Nigeria and in the United States and at the UN, I've spoken on this. So I find that some of these concerned groups are a bit duplicitous and they have another agenda, not the agenda of actually saving Africans and in changing the life so people are not hungry and not have to force to drink dirty water and don't have to stand on line to get a clean glass of water. Why can't Africans live like you and I are living here in Maryland and Washington, D.C., with electricity 24 7, clean water, roads? That's the life every human being, all human beings are created with the potential, the same potential of creative thought. That's what we're given by the Creator. Every single human being has it. That's what makes all human beings like. And we all will aspire to developing our minds and develop and changing the course of humanity to make it better for our children, for us having lived, we make an improvement for the next generation. This is what the human race really is all about. And it's not divided up into ethnicities and it's not divided up into rich and poor. It is human beings, we are one race of people and we have one aspiration, which is to live a productive, meaningful, dignified life and make it better for the, our children and our grandchildren for us having lived. That should be the program, but the West doesn't accept that. The West says, no, Africa, they have these problems. We're gonna call this guy a dictator. We're gonna call this country bad governance, and we're gonna tell them what they have to do, ignoring the rights of Africans. And I think that this, uh, there, there are countries that could potentially make progress in this area, but I think we need real strong leadership and if the West was really concerned, then they would start making investments in infrastructure. I'm right now working on a proposal to establish an infrastructure bank for Africa. It's just an embryonic state of discussion with some Africans, but it should have been built 50 years ago. We should have had an East-West Railroad in Africa already. It's so obvious that if you don't have transportation and you don't have electricity and you don't have clean water, then you're not gonna make any economic progress. And if you don't make any economic progress, then you're creating the fertile ground for destabilization, ethnic warfare, and regime change. A desperate, hungry people are the best soldiers for causing instability, for destabilizing countries. If you're desperate, you can be manipulated. If you're well-fed and you have a good job, and your children are getting a good education, then it becomes much harder. Um, I want to go um, to um, uh, genocide that you uh, mentioned. Um, obviously, um, the word genocide, like you said, is very uh, strong. Um, as an Ethiopian American myself, um, I come from a very mixed um, ethnic background, um, you know, through family, through marriage, through mm -hmm. um, friends and families and um, you know, and that, that's just the reflection of all Ethiopians. And like you said, um, we hurt whenever there's any um, Ethiopian hurting and we don't want innocent victims, especially to be uh, held hostage um, by a group of individuals who, who want to uh, overtake um, uh, power or mm -hmm. uh, over, or control hegemony in the country and so forth. And when the word genocide is thrown, 
it is it is offensive. It is offensive because we Ethiopians have um, um, a wonderful culture of caring for each other. We are a very well cultured um, country. We, uh, in in general, we we care for our elderly, for the sick, uh, for those uh, who are in need. I mean, that's engraved in our culture. Mm -hmm. And um, for a group of people to use the word genocide, uh, use it as a propaganda, and for it to be blown out of proportion by yep. organizations and media outlets all over the world. Um, how, um, you know, that is also kind of the proof mm -hmm. to what, you know, what you said about, you know, certain um, African countries already pre uh, meditated <laughs> someone has premeditated how things should go or something right. uh, because there are a lot of other concerning things like for instance the Tigray region has had um, I think over 1.5 million people on uh, food support even prior to this right. enforcement right. so that was an issue that's been going on um, right. and even with the issues that we have right now with the food shortage like you said the world food program director was there but many uh, european countries have actually withheld aid at this time yeah. at a time that you know at a time that they are saying um your people are in need but yet we're not giving you aid uh we're not going to support these uh victims so as i mean as an ethiopian american you know, I would like for the Ethiopian um, citizens to see this and what, you know, what it means. But um, you bringing that as how do you, f you know, fight these kind of uh, narratives um, outside, you know, for a regular citizen like me in the diaspora and for those back home, how do you fight these narratives? Because um, if we have gone through Adwa, uh, this, just like you said, might be another Adwa moment for us. And how, um, how do we mobilize uh, people like you? Um, people, there are uh, many people who um, feel like, um, who feel just like you, I'm sorry. Uh, and how do we strengthen um, that relationship and how do we uh, overcome this? Yeah, the, I, I would, I think you said it quite well. I mean, when I saw the genocide, I mean, I knew from my study that there was going to be a, a counterattack response by the government once the garrison of the defense forces was attacked in Mecca. But once you see genocide word come up, that, at that point, I knew it was an operation. Because just the use of that word, and I'd fought against this in Sudan for many, many years, but people kept telling me 400,000 people in Defour have been killed. And I said, where? I went to Defour twice. I stayed it. I mean, my wife and I visited at the Four refugee camp, which is not, this is very depressing in many ways. There was no genocide. There was an ugly war. But where did, where did these 400,000 bodies go? And so therefore, having been a veteran of that battle, once I saw the word genocide come up in Tigray, I said, well, genocide, that means they're gonna wipe out 5 million people. There has to be evidence of wiping out 5 million people. And of course there isn't. And, but that's how it confirms for me that this was an operation. The problem we have is, look, uh, and a lot of people because of my articles uh, have been said some very nasty, unpleasant things about me. And the problem is, and that expresses the problem, if people say, well, if you're saying this, then you must be a supporter of that. And you must be on the payroll of this, and you have to be part of that. <laughs> and you, we've lost, in the United States, it's very bad. We've lost the ability, well, as an African-American, uh, African you know that well, it's been yeah. going on here for the last four years, that we've actually lost some of the power of thinking. Americans, and I've been around now a long time. I started out as a, a radical in the 1960s, and I've studied American politics for over a, half a century. We're, we're, our thinking has gotten worse. We don't think, we react. We react to a name, we react to a slogan. We don't actually think. 
I would suggest, and I try to do this myself when I have the time, is people should spend some time every year or two reading Plato's dialogue so they learn how to think, because that's what, that's what Socrates was doing. So we don't have a thinking population in the United States, as, as proven by the actions of our people and elected officials, but that would be another show. But, and the same thing is in Africa. We have to demand that people actually think we should have forums where these ideas are discussed with not retaliatory threatening measures, people accusing someone of something or threatening them or accusing them of, of being a genocidalist or something. But we have to get Ethiopians together in public forums where we have a discussion. It can be a contentious discussion. I'm a New Yorker before I moved to Maryland, so we're, we're hard skinned on discussion. Right. And we can, have a, we can have a discussion and work through this because it is not, we're not animals. Human beings have the gift of creativity, of thinking through a power of reason. Animals don't have that power. We are capable of sitting down and having even a, a discussion, even if it's a contentious discussion, without being manipulated. And in the news media, look, they're operating for a policy. They're not doing this innocently. The, the, the news media has an ideology. And we, we actually saw that in, in the United States as well. Whatever you think somebody is, the news media is not playing an objective role. I mean, they're inflaming the situation deliberately on behalf of a policy, not in the interest of any Ethiopian and not in the interest of any Tigrayan. Those people, such as, uh, I, and I know their names, who advocated the separation of South Sudan from Sudan, were not helping the South Sudanese. They were not. They said they were, but they weren't, because since the separation, South Sudan has been a failed state of 12 million people. It's one of the worst places in Africa. And I would, so the separation was not done to help South Sudanese. Like the effort right now to gray, these people are cynical. They're not helping Tigrayans, because as you said, if people were serious, why don't we deal with improving the agriculture in Tigray? Why don't we improve why don't we have already a railroad that goes from Addis to Mecca and then goes further north, let's say, into the, the countries above? Why don't we have a grid of railroads crossing Africa, uh, Ethiopia? Why don't we have the, the level of agriculture we can bring in, fertilizer, irrigation, improve the land? That's what you could do if you cared about the Tigrayans. But these people don't care about, it. they're using the Tigrayan issue. They're using this conflict for a, what we call colored revolution to destabilize the country. They're not honest brokers really concerned. Now the population is ripped up, very emotional, very reactive, and people have to calm down and think it through. Why is this happening? What could be happening instead? How could we develop our country? if we wanted to. And again, if you want to look at people dying, look at the Central African Republic, a small country of five million people in the middle of Central Africa. The conditions there arguably could be the worst of any country in the world. I did a study on Central African Republic and there's no transportation, there's no railroad, there are no roads, there are no doctors, there are no schools, nothing. Why? There's no good reason for it. It's right in the center of Africa. And my program, which I gave to people in car, is to make uh, to make the country actually Bangui a center of transportation and commerce, capital of the car. But no one complains about that. They'll talk about the military and this very uh, difficult military situation there. But they don't talk about the underlying conditions in the car. They don't talk about what's been going on in Tigray or other parts of, of Ethiopia. So we, we have to now be leaders, all of us have to think. I, I mean, for my, I have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, and I think differently than most people do. I'd be happy to share this knowledge with people in Ethiopia, to teach classes, to have forums, to have dialogue. And the Ethiopians, uh, the, uh, I've been to the Ethiopian embassy for public events and they've actually had people come up and question the policy. 
That's the right way to do it. Let them question the policy. Let them come up with a better idea than the non-ethnic party, which the, which the prime minister has come up with. So I, I think we're, we're challenged, not just in Tigray, not just in Ethiopia, we are challenged around the world. We have a paucity of leaders. We have a, a lower level of thinking than we had 20, 30, 40 years ago. These are problems that a whole civilization is facing. And we have elected leaders uh, in various parts of the world who are trying to perform a job and we have other conditions where they're not. But this operation against Ethiopia is you're trying to undermine one of the few countries on the continent that has taken bold measures to improve the standard of living of the people. And that's, that's a crime, that's a shame, and it, sh and it should end. And I would propose to the Biden administration, I have in some of my writings, that they cut out this nonsense, that they stop withholding $270 million, and they work with Ethiopia to build infrastructure in the country. That is the most important ingredient that would change the conditions of life for the majority of people. Not just giving aid, but building more railroads, more roads, more manufacturing plants. And this is something the United States should do and it has done on rare occasions in the past. But to, to attack the country and to withhold aid in this time uh, is a very, very unthoughtful policy by my government. Well, um, Mr. Freeman, I, I, I don't know what to say, but um, this is a lot to digest. I, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, I do uh, uh, wanna say um, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming. Uh, we definitely, it sounds like um, this needs to be more than just a, a one-time situational thing, but more of a movement, more of mm -hmm. an advocacy work. And one of the things that I've worked in in my background, even though it's public health is an advocacy and policy. And one of, one of the most important things is relationships and um, educating um, as part of it, like you said. And I think um, even the American uh, people, uh, if educated about it, oh, will sure. be advocating for this. Um, because just like we've advocated for other things for Africa in the past, whether it's um, uh, for um, uh, programs like uh, Save the Children or anything in the past that has um, been both in Africa or even here, uh, in the U.S. for minority groups. I think it's something that, um, that can be grown, but I certainly see the need for forums and education and, um, um, you know, having honest dialogues uh, such as the one we just had. So I am really thankful. Um, I really appreciate you and taking your time um, and spending time with me and the Ethiopian people. Um, I will definitely not leave you alone. <laughs> so um, thank you again. Um, and you can save one, uh, take a minute uh, okay. and conclude your message. You would, uh, responding to you, the, the American people know next to nothing about Africa. I teach courses in Africa. And I always start off by saying you know, how big it is, you know, how many countries there are. The only thing they know is what's in the newspapers. Post, the Times, Newsweek, this is a bad man, this is a dictator, this is bad government, this is corruption. They know nothing. So when I start discussing these policies in my classes, people's eyes light up because they've been deprived of any education about Africa. But we've also been deprived of the education about the United States. Most people don't even know how the United States was funded and founded. So we have a big ed educational task. So we all, like you and I, we have to be educators and we have to be preachers and we have to inspire and we have to teach and we have to change the way people think. That's, that's our job. And design policies that will benefit and improve the standard of living of all people, including in Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Freeman. Thank and you. thank you all our audience for being part of this program. My pleasure. 